Hello, librarians. Thank you for joining us today. This is Chris Connolly with the HarperCollins Library Marketing Team, joined by my colleague, Lainey Mays. And then, of course, the star of this show, the one and only New York Times bestselling author, Laura Lipman. Laura, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks um, for having me. Absolutely. Well, it is National Library Week, as many of you already know. Today, specifically, is National Library Workers Day. So I think this is a great way to set things off with Laura, who is a Library Reads Hall of Fame author, amongst her many other accolades. I'm going to read a few of them off here. Uh, since your debut in 1997, you've been recognized as a distinctive voice in mystery fiction and named one of the essential crime writers of the last 100 years. Your books have won most of the major awards in your field and have been translated into more than 20 languages. You live in Baltimore and New Orleans with your family. Uh, and your new book, Dream Girl, is coming June 22nd, which is what we're here to talk about. But uh, again, Laura, it's our joy to have you back on Door to Door. I think you're our first repeat author, potentially. You oh, wow. Very beginning. Very honored. So this is uh, quite the occasion. Um, so yeah, just to start things off, would you mind telling viewers about Dream Girl? So Dream Girl is a novel that I started writing, this is key, in February, 2019. And so back then, if we can all remember, the idea of writing a novel about someone who was isolated in his own home with no hope of getting out anytime soon seemed you know, quite contrary to the lives most of us were living. It, that's been something interesting in a lot of fiction. A lot of people were writing books well before there was a pandemic that seemed to resonate with the times we're living in. And I've heard different theories about how that is. I don't think I'm particularly prescient. I just sort of follow where my gut takes me. The setup for Dream Girl is that a writer has fallen. He's hurt himself badly and he's confined to bed. And if it sounds a little bit like misery, well, that was an inspiration. And um, the thing is though, is that Jerry Anderson doesn't have anyone who would proclaim themselves to be his number one fan. He's stuck in a luxury apartment in downtown Baltimore. And the only people he sees are his relatively new assistant who doesn't seem to like him very much and an overnight nurse who doesn't seem to care about him very much and definitely is not even a reader. And I really wanted to explore what it would be like to be isolated in the middle of a dense population. A lot of horror deals with isolation with no people around. And I wanted to kind of flip it and look at the way that we might be more isolated than we think even when we live in a big bustling city. And I also wanted to examine what it feels like to be losing one's mind. Again, something that I think we can all relate to now, where you begin to think, what is reality? Am I losing my mind? Do I have dementia? Why, why, why am I having these weird things going on? And for Jerry, this is a particularly poignant question. His mother has recently died of dementia and he's getting these weird phone calls and maybe a letter and perhaps even a visit from a woman who claims to be the inspiration for the title character of his most famous book, Dream Girl, which baffles him because there is no such person. And it also baffles him that no one else in his life can vouch for the fact that these things are even happening. There's no record of the phone calls. The letter that he thinks he saw disappears. And there's certainly no one who can confirm that there's ever been a visit but one day he wakes up and there is a body and that's about as much as I'll tell right now I think that's a brilliant setup and it is it's tricky to talk about any thriller particularly yours though because they are so twisty and complex without giving it away so I think that's a great setup so and with Jerry I'm just curious because not only do you have the mystery element you have a very interesting character study of him and his inner thoughts. And I'm curious, you know, you're coming off your essay collection, My Life as a Villainess, and you're really dealing with a lot of social issues at the core of this book. How did that work? I mean, did, do you feel like you coming off those essays that kind of helped set you up for this book and really bring to life this character? I, I hadn't thought about it that way. And I find that really intriguing, having spent so much time in my own head to write the essays that suddenly I put myself in someone else's head, who's also kind of narrowly focused and thinking mostly about his life. For me, it was Lady in the Lake, the book that I published in 2019, 
that set me up for Dream Girl because I wanted to do the most opposite thing possible. And here I'd written this really big cast, two major characters, and then 20 other people who each have a voice in the book, even if it's only for one chapter. It was historic, it was panoramic, it felt big. And I really wanted to do something claustrophobic. And I really wanted to examine who we are inside our own heads, which is where we are the hero or heroines of our own stories. I wanted to look at the always, this is something that runs through a lot of my work. The most troubling people are the people who define themselves as good. And defining oneself as, as good is perhaps the best way to ensure that you're probably doing something very bad. And I really wanted to work on the trick of will the reader be able to see through Jerry's version of himself? It's not in first person, but it's definitely in his head. Everything is from his point of view. And I wanted to see if the reader would be onto the fact that Jerry, maybe not such a good person, certainly well-intended, wanted to be a good person, but seems to have a particular talent for not noticing when he's being a terrible person really quick to rationalize and forgive himself for some pretty bad stuff along the way. And I wanted to examine memory. Again, I, I mean, everyone my age, well, not even just my age, dementia is one of the things that so many people think about and talk about, and it's becoming an ever more serious problem with the people living longer, more and more people can expect to deal with this in their lifetime. You're certainly gonna deal with it within your family, most likely. And it's terrifying. It's especially, you know, who, who, do, who is not terrified of dementia? No one can say, oh, I'm sure I'd be able to deal with that. And so I wanted to look at how Jerry's memory is working. And it really begins to fray over the course of the book. And whereas in the beginning of the book, he reaches for memories that are very concrete and make sense. Like, oh, there's a snowstorm. So he remembers a story about a snowstorm when he was a kid. Oh, I was in the hospital. Remember that time I had appendicitis when I was a kid? Toward the end of the book, the connections are so much more tenuous and you can just feel his, I hope, his mind leaping from subject to subject without any real logic or coherence. I love that you say that about memory because I, I enjoyed getting to know like him coming to those realizations because he would even do it in his own stories. And I was thinking, wait, that's not the story you said before, you know, like you're even right. editing yourself and it really does kind of make you think about what you edit for yourself you're your own main character um and I think yesterday we spoke and you talked about like the gargoyle setting on the shoulder oh. of you but can you talk about that and right so this is a book written um not in first person which I think would have been trickier but in you know close third and I've always defined close third as the gargoyle on the shoulder it's somehow it's the person's view of themselves, but it creates just enough space so that the reader can see that very few, as, very few of us are reliable narrators about ourselves. And so they can see the gap between what the person is saying about themselves and what's really true. And, you know, there are definitely scenes in the book where I think only Jerry sees it that way. Only Jerry would tell the story that way. And the reader can instantly see, well, I don't know. I mean, like, there's, Jerry had a father who was a philanderer. We learned that pretty quickly. And, you know, it was not only a philanderer, he was an out and out bigamist. And so Jerry wanted to, of course, to be the opposite, to be steadfast and true. And in his mind, he has been. And then you find out, well, there was this incident, but oh, he was the victim. Or there's this thing, but oh, that was consensual. And there was this thing, but my wife was really into it. <laughs> You're like, you know, um, I, I'll admit, um, I have a really good friend from my teenage years and her dad was married four times. And my mother always said, is like, at number four, you have to begin to think it's about you. <laughs> so, so Jerry's had, and actually Jerry even kind of has that thought. It's like being married four times is ridiculous. I'm not doing that. But he's been married three times. and has had most recently this extremely problematic girlfriend who is turning very, it's very hard to get rid of. So yeah, I, I like to think that, I think readers from the very beginning, after, as soon as you hit that first chapter the floating about the floating staircase and his accident, I think you very 
quickly begin to see that there's this gap between who Jerry thinks he is and who he really is. Yeah, I, I love that. And, it, and it's not as if he doesn't have, you know, he doesn't in the analyze his thoughts. It's not about that. It is really about this fully formed psyche that's flawed yeah. in ways that are just really brilliant. Um, oh, thank you. Of course. Um, so I, I just wanted to talk about Baltimore. Of course, you're a longtime Baltimore resident. This book is set in Baltimore. How was it to return to, to Baltimore as a setting and almost as like a character within the book? In, in a very modern version of Baltimore, you know, it helps. Jerry and I are almost virtually the same age. Uh, we grew up in different parts of the city. <laughs> I don't want to say this because it makes me sound horrible. In some ways, he's the most autobiographical character I've ever written. I, you know, not so much socially. I feel like I've, I've not behaved as Jerry has in my personal life. But you know, this desire to be a writer, to be this kind of white bread person growing up in Baltimore. It was interesting to write about Baltimore through Jerry's eyes because Jerry is someone who yearned to escape Baltimore and saw New York as his true home. He only came back to the city this time because his mother was dying and he, he's, he, is fearful of being stuck there. He's actually already plotting to leave again throughout much of the book. He's like, okay, well, you know, it turns out I didn't need to buy an apartment. My mother didn't linger in hospice as large. So I've got to get out of here as soon as it's financially feasible. So I'm, I'm writing about it through his point of view. And, you know, he's not as kind as I would be. Um, I, <laughs> I don't think I would ever choose to live where Jerry chose to live. It's um, the building, while it's fictitious in its location, I think a lot of people are going to associate it with a particular high rise in that part of Baltimore, where for a while the swimmer Michael Phelps did in fact own one of the penthouse units. I don't think there was ever a shake who had one, but, um, and it is this sort of odd, odd man out on the local landscape. It's surrounded by very low little um, row houses and just sticks up there on the point. And it is quite beautiful and has gorgeous views. Um, so, I mean, I see Jerry as very different because he's, he's such a prisoner of the city. He's, he's not there on his own recognizance. And during the pandemic, I have since December, it actually started right after I finished the book, but since in December, it got real, really intense. I began deciding to walk five miles every day by getting up early. And I live not far from Jerry. I live about a mile and a half, maybe two miles from where he lives. And I walk along the waterfront and there's this very prominent landmark, the Domino Sugar sign. And I began taking pictures of it every morning. And then it turned out they were taking it down to be replaced. And I sort of, I thought a lot about sort of how I see the waterfront, how he would see it. Um, there's a lot in Baltimore that's difficult and challenging. It's a city where crime is a problem, poverty is a problem, but it's also a city where I, along with a lot of people I know and love have chosen to live and send our kids to public schools and find, you know, one, one of the things that I felt really robbed of by the pandemic, everyone has their list, I'm sure, but my neighborhood has a block party every year. And we were coming up on the 10th anniversary of that block party. And that was like, well, that's not going to happen this year. And so, yeah, so Jerry and I are very different Baltimoreans and he doesn't see half of the charm. He also is uninterested in food. That was the hardest part about writing about him is that he's so uninterested in food. And I am not that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a fascinating aspect of him. He's very serious about that. Just, just not a foodie at all. Uh, Lainey, did you have a question? Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the literary scene in the book, because it is about, you know, it's a different book editing and, uh, you know, he has his agents that, that's in his life, but he also is very intrigued, and he's been a professor, um, but he's very intrigued by people who want to be writers and use him for advice, but they don't want to read. And he finds that kind of refreshing when his assistant is like the opposite. But I don't know if you want to talk about that, his relationship maybe with his students sure. or his writing career. I mean, I teach writing. I taught at Goucher. 
uh, I actually pulled on some of my experiences from Goucher for Jerry. I taught as adjunct. I still teach in a program at Eckerd College called Writers in Paradise. I typically teach crime fiction. You know, I am certainly aware of, and for the most part, just amused by people who want to create a stratification or a hierarchy in literature and say, well, here's literature and this is genre. I mean, to me, those are marketing words. And I, I and I, I, what I really don't understand is like if someone within a genre writes a really, really good book, then people are like, okay, we will call this literature. And it, it's like, eh. anyway, so Jerry's definitely a snob and a particular kind of snob that, you know, I've, I've met and talked to and, and I find his views, I, I don't disagree with him on everything. I mean, I think the main thing, I've talked about the character being autobiographical. The main thing that um, Jerry and I believe in is that it begins with imagination and research is fine. I do it you know, to a certain extent. But <laughs> I think Donald Westlake said in one of the first interviews I ever heard with him is I became a novelist so I could make everything up. And I think that is something that people forget. And I think they forget the power of their own imagination to help them get things right. It's really interesting that if you really think through other people's lives, you can begin to sort of suss out some stuff and it still helps, especially if you're writing about a particular profession. Uh, it, it helps a lot to do a little bit of research, but probably not as much as you need to do. And the point should be, I have an imagination. I'm not just writing about my own life. I recently got an email about Lady in the Lake that came from one of my former colleagues at The Sun, but he was, he'd been in the Baltimore scene his entire journalism life. So he'd started in the sixties or maybe early seventies at the afternoon newspaper that was very much the model for the paper in Lady in the Lake. And he was like, I thought this was so-and-so and this was so-and-so and you got this right and you got that right. And I didn't know who any of these people were. I, but I did know a lot about newspaper life in Baltimore in the 60s because that was my dad's life. And so I was really just trying to imagine myself into my dad's life. And, you know, of course, I knew a lot of these people when they were much older. So, you know, I knew, for example, this particularly very crotchety older female reporter. And I was like, well, what was she like when she was in her 30s? Who would she have been? And anyway, um, that's you know, that's how I wanted to um, deal with the literary scene. You know, I wonder about that. I, I, I don't want people to play a guessing game because Jerry isn't based on anybody. And there's a reason I'm vague about his work. You can't really say, oh, this is supposed to be so-and-so. I don't think. And if anyone did say that, they'd be wrong because he's an amalgam of so many literary writers I've met and read about. And, you know, so, like some of my best friends are literary writers. You're saying if you got a phone call saying that they know who this is really based on, you would not. Yeah, they, they'd be wrong. It. It's not like it's not like you're so vain. It's, there's not actually an inspiration. Oh. So, and you know, I was thinking about so Jerry again. He has a lot of. Inner, inner dialogue about what he's seeing, what he disagrees with, especially when it comes to the younger helpers. He's dealing with two millennial women who are helping him out. And he has a lot of dialogue about what he's allowed to say, what he's not allowed to say. Could you talk about, you know, confronting a lot of the social issues we're talking about, cancel culture? Cancel culture. The, yeah. So um, I find it really interesting that people find it so burdensome to think before they speak. I have found it to be edifying to think before I speak. I have found it to be a worthwhile and positive exercise to think, hey, wait a minute, what does that word mean in this context to how it will affect the other person? Um, wait a minute, is this joke worth making? I, I was recently doing a rewatch of a pretty popular TV show. I'm not gonna name it. Um, where, and it's only about like 10 years old, I think. And I was like, 
God, a lot of the jokes require on kind of stupid stereotypes. Like there was a joke about the ADHD boyfriend and I'm like, is that funny? It's like, that just feels like kind of an insensitive, I mean, he either has attention deficit disorder or you're trying to say something else that could be funnier. And so you begin to notice how lazy people are when it comes to humor in particular. And this idea of we can't make jokes anymore. I think actually maybe you can't make bad jokes anymore. Maybe you need to make better jokes. And if your idea of a joke was something that was intensely homophobic, Hmm, maybe rethink that. So I've never minded. Um, I don't mind owning mistakes I've made in the past. You know, I, I just finished editing a book of my own short stories that will be released next year. They've been released in different places. Some of these stories were 10 years old. And I thought long and hard about a story that was about a young black girl. And should I be writing that story? Was it a story of appropriation? Had I been insensitive? I mean, in the end, I was like, you know what? I feel like, no, this is not the story that makes the mistake of a white character achieving something they need through a black person's pain. If anything, it seems that in a way it's a ghost story um, that the young black girl is freed through her own efforts. But I, I just, I like these conversations and I think they're helpful. And I get that people are terrified of saying something wrong, but they need to push past that because that's just about discomfort. It's like, I don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to say anything wrong, but they're not then saying in order to be that person, what do I have to do? They're like, can I just play by the rules I've been playing by for most of my life? I'm way too old to learn something new. You know, I, I am old, I'm, you know, I'm 62 years old. I spend a lot of time in conversation with much younger people. I'm part of a writer's group where the women are much, much younger than I am. And I've learned a lot from them because I'm paying attention and they, <laughs> they're millennials. I'm actually very pro millennial. Um, my stepson and his girlfriend are millennials and they're two of the best people I know. So I don't tend to engage in that kind of generational war for her. And if anything, I think boomers are just hilariously awful. <laughs> Sorry, I, I mean, I think, I feel like as a tail end boomer, I kind of like can go, yeah, those boomers, they're terrible. And um, I, Jerry is, you know, he just wants to be able to say what he wants to say when he wants to say it. And he, he has an obsession with people's skin color. And what do you call non-white people? And it comes up again and again. And he's like, why can't I ask? Why can't I ask what their origins are? I don't get that. And how dare someone say that I have a fetish for Asian women? That's not true. It, it kind of actually seems to be true if you're looking carefully in the book. He definitely knows. He knows how he should frame how he shouldn't be talking about something before he does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he doesn't like it. He doesn't yeah. like it. And he's, he's pissed off about it. Yeah. And I love the, the thought idea of, you know, a lot of times it's avoidance of hard topics to spare oneself the discomfort as opposed to actually, you know, moving forward with an idea or with a conversation with you use a point um, or points of view, excuse me. Um, and Laura, I know you had a, a passage you wanted to read. Of the book. Oh, yeah. So I have, I have the book here. This is, you know, a galley, but very close to what the finished copy will look like. And I'm just going to read a teeny bit from the very, very beginning. Jerry dreams in a rented hospital bed high above the city, higher than he ever thought possible in stodgy, low slung Baltimore. Jerry is asleep more often than he's awake. He floats, he wakes, he drifts, he dreams. He tosses, but he cannot turn. He is winking, blinking, and nod, casting his net over the glittering lights of downtown. Deceptively beautiful at night, a city where someone might choose to live, no longer a city where one gets stuck, not at night, not in his dreams. There is no clear demarcation between Jerry's dreams and his fantasies, his not quite asleep and his not really awake. His brain chugs, stuck in a single gear, focused on one thought or one image. Tonight he feels he is revolving ever so slowly, like the old restaurant on top of the Holiday Inn. Then he finds himself hanging from the minute hand of the clock in the neighboring Bromo Seltzer Tower, a charm city Harold Lloyd, slipping, slipping, slipping. Someone is waiting on the sidewalk below, arms outstretched. It's a woman, but he can't see her face. 
he lets go and he wakes up, or does he? Great setup. Um, and readers will just have to pick up a copy and find out. Um, so yeah. Lenny, I think uh, we have some questions maybe from librarian viewers, if you have a few more minutes, Laura, is oh, that sure, okay? Oh, sure, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see here. One from Casey Davis. So you mentioned that your latest book parallels what so many of us have been facing during the pandemic. Where does your storytelling go from here? In terms of the pandemic, uh, the pandemic is the backdrop of the next book that I'm writing. And I've decided it has nothing to do with the pandemic. The story is the story, and it just happens to be set from the summer of 2000 and summer of 2019 to spring of 2021. And it's written with zero foreshadowing. There's not a character in this book that he, they don't even hear radio reports about this mysterious illness in China, but you just see people, they go from living our lives as we used to live them. And then it's like, oh, are we shaking hands or bumping elbows? Or do you have a mask? Um, it, it, can we find an outdoor place to eat? What shall we do there? You know, it, but it, that's all just backdrop. And I really enjoyed it. It was, like, I, I also recently wrote a novella for the new short story collection that set during the pandemic, the early part, it already feels historical. Last spring feels like a very different era. And I wrote a story about a youngish married couple who decide to spend those early days watching every single episode of Columbo. <laughs> and then the wife decides it would be really entertaining if they went on a dating site under assumed names to see if they could find each other again. And things do not turn out as she planned. You always leave viewers excited, Laura. I think I remember <laughs> first hearing about Dream Girl when we spoke about a year ago, and now we have ever more to look forward to. So that's great. Uh, we did have a question from Jennifer Winberry. Were there any surprises as you wrote Jerry's story that made that made you rethink things? There was definitely something I thought I was going to do in this book that I ended up not doing to explain what it was would be a big spoiler, but it was driven by my understanding of Jerry's character. You know, to what extent did I feel that Jerry was capable of understanding his own life? So yeah, that was a big, that was probably the biggest surprise. Um, it was much funnier than I said, right? I mean, it's weird to say that one has written a funny book, but as I went along, I was like, this is actually pretty funny. And, and then as it, you know, it takes a pretty macabre turn about halfway through and you know one character in particular has what I'll call um, hidden depths <laughs> unusual resources and that character just cracked me up I would just every time she walked into the scene I was like she's hilarious even if she doesn't know it love it yeah it, it is surprisingly humorous at points in the book I mean it's a great balance I, I don't know how you pull that off but that's why you are you and I meet and uh, to all of our benefit. So I think that was all of our questions. There's just so much love, Laura, for you, your books, for your appearance here today. So much appreciation. Um, again, uh, Dream Girl goes until June 22nd. So not that far off mm -mm. Year before we know it. Summer comes soon. There's the wonderful jacket. Um, yeah, and again, I just want to thank you so much for appearing on National Library Workers Day. We couldn't have had a better guest. So Laura, thank you so, so much. Thank, thank you. And thanks to all the librarians, as I never get tired of mentioning, I'm the daughter of a librarian. My own library memories are many and all warm and loving. So thanks for everything that everyone does. And, you know, I hope to see you in some of your libraries at some point, maybe next year, we'll have a more normal tour. But until then, I'm still using my library. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Be well. Take care. Bye. Bye. Oh. <laughs> well, All right.
speaking of before we bring Kate on, but let's do a mini library national library week if that's okay. Sure. Okay. So happy National Library Week. And we've had um we have a lot of celebrations going on throughout the week. You can go to our blog and find out everything, librarylovefest.com, about what I'm gonna say. But I just quickly want to show you guys a couple of things we're doing. So you can leave us a note, you can send it to your patrons, you can give it to anyone, someone walking down the street, a link, whatever. Tell people to let us know why they love their library. Look at all these great things that we have coming. I mean, we have authors writing in, Morgan Jerkins, Jacqueline Winspear, Andrew Graff. You can go read these, and this is all on our blog, and then you can put your own and send it to the community. And then we're going to do a, blog, um, a podcast episode on Wednesday. So be sure to be checking in. We're going to read all of them. We have a couple more, including some audio ones. Let's just hear one before we move on. This is from Wiley Cash. This is Wiley Cash, author of When Ghosts Come Home. I love libraries because they've always given me a place to go from the time when I was six years old and got my first library card to the time when I was writing my third novel, The Last Ballad, and we moved to a new town, and I literally had nowhere to go except for my local library, where I found a quiet place and a desk and friendly people. Thanks for all you do, librarians. So, yeah, we have... Yeah, we have lots of things and lots of love and, you know, we appreciate all that you do and we want to make sure you hear all of the love coming in. Laura also gave a really great quote that's featured on our blog. So go check it out and we'll see you throughout the week. All right. So next up, should we bring on Kate White? So here we go. Yeah. Okay. Hey, should I uh, maybe close this wind, uh, the shades a little bit? You look great, Kate. I think it's, I think we're a okay. Okay, um, perfect. Yeah, and thanks for thanks for joining us um, on again. This is National Library Workers Day. In case you didn't see that, so we think this is a great way to celebrate. Again, you are a best-selling beloved author, uh, <laughs> huge in libraries. So everyone's very excited to see you here today and. Uh, we're live and ready to talk about your next book. Lainey, do you want to introduce Kate? Yeah. So Kate, I'm going to introduce you really quick, and then I'm going to let you talk about the new book. So um, let me bring up, they can look at the new beautiful cover, which I want to talk about in a minute. But I'll I'm obsessed. So good. That is one heck of a cover. Right? Yeah. Okay. So Kate White, the former editor-in-chief of Cosmopolitan Magazine and the New York Times bestselling author of several standalones, including uh, eight Bailey Wiggins mysteries. Um, and you have so many books under your belt and you're just an amazing thriller writer. Everyone loves you. Um, it's editor of Anthony and Agatha or nominated the Mystery Writers of America cookbook. And we're so excited to have you here to talk about your new thriller the fiance what okay we got to talk about this cover before you tell us about the book <laughs> that the tick with the blood oh oh my yeah goodness yeah i just oh. love that and they're gonna make the red a fifth color so it really pops and that just made my day when i heard that <laughs> yeah, well, i can tell oh i'm sorry i just want to say i can tell yeah, between the book and the jacket i mean you ha obviously have a designer's eye and eye for color and style so how involved were you with the jacket I i'm curious well i accept the fact that even though cosmopolitan was the number one selling magazine on newsstands uh, single copy sales in the united states when i was the editor books are different and the consumer is different. And so I don't pretend to know how to do a book cover, but I know what draws me and that, that I, I need to see a little bit of mystery and strong colors. And so I did because they asked and they were very eager to hear a uh, wonderful Harper. They asked me to share some of my thoughts on what I would love. So I wrote a memo and <laughs> they really took it to heart. And I was so thrilled when I saw it. I think in the room, if you had heard all of us in sales, when they showed the cover, everyone was like, <gasps> like that is it. It's, <laughs> it's really, and her lipstick kind of pulls all the red together. It's beautiful. 
Yeah, and I think there's something about just the photo. She looks like somebody that maybe you should be very afraid when you see her coming. Exactly. Well, do you want to tell us a little bit about the fiance? Sure. Well, it's what's called a locked room mystery, which kind of weren't that popular for a while. Uh, Agatha Christie wrote them, of course, and Niall Marsh, but they've, they've come back into popularity lately with Ruth Ware and Lucy Foley. And I had actually written kind of half of a locked room mystery a number of uh, years ago, and I always wanted to do one that was just totally a locked room mystery, meaning that everything takes place in one location. So you can be pretty darn sure that if somebody's been murdered, that the murderer is probably sitting right there at the same table with you. And so I did it really just out of an interest, not so much because of the new popularity, but uh, quickly, it's about uh, a voiceover actress named Summer Redding. And she's married to a guy named Gabe Keaton. And they drive out to the parents, his parents sprawling estate out in Pennsylvania to spend a week's vac vacation along with Summer's stepson. And it's they do it every year and Gabe has three brothers. It's usually a lot of fun. Two of the brothers are married. And, uh, but this time all of a sudden the younger brother shows up with this woman, Hannah. And things uh, are tense for Summer because of she, she has reason to believe Hannah is not someone to be trusted. And then someone in the family dies. And what usually in a locked room mystery, everybody's really scared because they, they know they could be next. The, the twist in this is that um, Summer, uh, believe it or not, that is room service. Excuse me one second. I bet you've never had this happen. <laughs> Thank you. That's so funny. It's a first. Um, <laughs> totally fine. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the twist in this one is that only Summer realizes that probably the death wasn't from natural causes. And she has a hard time convincing her husband there's a problem. He thinks she's just being jealous and paranoid. And no one gets that the fact that they're in danger and somebody else could very likely die and does. <laughs> it's so fun being introduced to this family and this estate as well, because I just found myself really drawn to everyone and to the just the sights and the sounds and the smells. You really bring it to vivid life and it seemed so perfect, so <laughs> very, very perfect and, and beautiful. Little oh, does the reader know. So you really set it up quite nicely. What's it like? Because you know, you have your best-selling Bailey Wagon series, and then you do standalones, and, and you kind of balance them both out. What's the experience like doing a standalone versus returning to a like a longer running series like you have? Well, the great thing about doing a standalone, if you do if you do a series, is that it energizes you because as much as I've loved writing the Bailey Wagons books. And the last one in 2019 was nominated for an International Thriller Writers Award. So that made me feel what I was doing was still working. But you need a break sometimes to think about that character and see how she's gonna evolve. And, and to be honest, I think this is a moment right now where standalones are really selling very well and your publisher wants you to do them though. There are Bailey fans that, that write in saying, Where's Bailey? What's happened? You haven't done a Bailey book in a few years. But I, but what I like about the fiance, because Summer is this voiceover actress and kind of irreverent, it gave me a chance to bring a little of that Bailey irreverence to this character. And that was good for me because I snuck a little, a bit of that in. She has a great voice. Um, and especially as she kind of becomes keen on this newcomer and how she isn't everything that she claims to be. I mean, I love that setup of, you know, she's trying to convince her husband, he doesn't really buy into it and things snowball quickly. What's your plotting process like for something like this? And is it is it wildly different when you're doing like a locked room setup as this book is? For me, it's pretty much the same thing. I, I don't know, I, well, I'm sure you guys do that, that, there are plotters and pantsers. You've heard those terms, of 
workforce, right? And once I heard the term pantser, meaning the author worked by the seat of their pants, I thought, I'm just never going to be called a pantser. I just, <laughs> please don't call me a pantser. But I naturally, maybe because I'm a Virgo and very, tend to be very kind of rigid in so, certain respects and organized, I have to know where I'm going when I sit down to write either a standalone or a Bailey Wagons mystery. I need to know who the killer is, why the person killed. And I also need to know roughly how I'm going to disguise that person and throw out there some red herrings and misdirection, but at the same time, give some decent clues because I don't want to cheat the reader. And I, I love the fact that often readers will say to me, I didn't see it coming, but, but you didn't pull the the wool over my eyes either in a tricky way. And so I need to know those things. And then from there, I tend to more succinctly plot out four to five chapters at a time. And I use a, a notebook to do that. And it's been, that's kind of fun for me because not everything is known. And one of the magical things that happen when you write is sometimes things come to you even as you're just jotting notes, outline notes down in the notebook, it'll be all of a sudden you realize something, <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> please don't read that too closely, anyone. But, but that's kind of how I work. I like to do a grid of four chapters at a time. And I always know more than I've written there, but there's just little clues for me. And then I can see where the next few chapters are going at that point. And that is helpful for me, it really is. And then I go on to the next four, but I always know where I'm going. Interesting. Also, go Virgos, I'm a Virgo too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I think that that's so interesting to, to see what people do for different writing styles. And I'm always intrigued by the main character's profession. And so Summer is this actor, obviously that's a link to knowing this Hannah person, but um, I wondered like, does that ever change when you're writing to kind of, or do you kind of know like the character first before you kind of get to the mystery? Like what uh, changes? Well, I probably have the plot first. I'll start with a germ of something. I've read someplace. It could be a headline. It could just be a phrase. And I know a lot of people start with character, but I start with that little plot and the, and the twist in my head. But then quickly, I have to have the character because it's nothing without the character and why she, and I say she, because all my protagonists, main protagonists are female, what her motivations are going to be. Someone like Summer is dealing with not having the career she quite, quite wants. I mean, she wants to be an actress, but it's not going as well as she hopes. So a lot of what informs her is her, her feeling of I'm, I'm falling behind and some envy of this other character in the book, the fiance. And I also feel I, have to do a lot of research on the profession. I read a book a few years ago where the main character was um, the, the, an editor at a magazine and it was so wrong. And I'm sure the reader didn't care, but for me, it really bugged me. So I try to do things that I have already a certain amount of knowledge of, like my husband, uh, who was a news anchor for many years after 9-11, and decided to go back to his college major and became an actor. And he does voiceover work. And so I know a fair amount about that world through him. And my daughter was a theater major in college. So there's some things from plays he's been in that are in this book. And he's going to read it and go, oh, wow, you just, you stole that from me. But that, that for me is important to really research the profession and feel I've got it pretty close to accurate. This is not a spoiler, but there is a point where Summer is recording an audiobook and the author makes <laughs> an unexpected appearance and causes some trouble. So I'm curious if you've ever stood in on any of your own books being recorded as audiobooks. I haven't, but what kind of gave me the idea, I did do a voiceover of one of my career books. And it was uh, it was fun to do. And I love the person who was the director. 
and the producer, they were so wonderful. And I pumped them a lot, even before I knew I was going to write this character. I was just so curious about it. And I think maybe on a subconscious level, I was already thinking I could do a voiceover actress as a character one day. And even when I was in that studio and the director was making some suggestions to me I think I was toying with the idea of what if she were being a real uh difficult person here or she had the you know an author here and what that would be like because I know just from doing public speaking myself and talking to my husband and daughter as as sure-footed as you might feel as a as someone who has to get up and perform, sometimes you can really have somebody do some, just like they have those coolers in Las Vegas who can cool you at the gambling table. Somebody can be a speech cooler and a performance cooler. And so I felt I'd give Summer that experience. Interesting. And I think you had a little bit to read. Do you? Do you ah, read? Yeah. yeah, that'd be fun. It's not too long because I'm not a very good reader. And I used to think when I first started and I would do readings, people would think I probably had the book, book ghost written because, because I didn't seem too familiar with the text. <laughs> anyway, be great. after Summer and her husband arrive at the family's beautiful estate, it's the first night and there's a cocktail party and everybody's gathered. And Summer sees her brother-in-law Nick's new date and realizes she knows her she recognizes her they were in a showcase together so hannah who is the new girl starts talking to summer and she says that she's sorry that she wasn't able to meet the family before now even though she and nick have only been dating two months months and summer says actually you and i have met before really yeah we were both in the same playwriting showcase Two Octobers ago, I watch as Hannah tips her head in confusion. Showcase. Yes, one with six or seven 10 minute plays down in the West Village. Hmm, I'm afraid you must have me mixed up with someone else, she says. I've never done a showcase in the village. This is totally bizarre. I have no idea why, but she's just told me a big fat lie. And that's the moment that Hannah begins to realize she she shouldn't trust Summer, that she might be hiding something. Because as she says later, um, in the in this little play that Summer was uh, that Hannah was in, she played a a cat that a professor turns into a woman. And Summer says, "Well, why would she be embarrassed admitting to that? There's a whole musical about people <laughs> playing cats, but she knows." She begins to suspect there's something not yeah. good about Hannah. And having two actors face off against each other, I mean, I think that's <laughs> so good. And it makes for some really intense scenes some, uh, between the two. I really loved that. Um, so, yeah, I, it's so good. I just want to see, oh, Bill Anderson, our friend Bill Anderson asked, how long it typically, typically takes you to plot a book from start to finish in your notebooks? Well, it usually takes me a couple of months to get an idea going in my head. But because I have to write a book a year, I'm always starting to create that idea for the next book while I'm finishing one. And in fact, right now I have a book due in a couple of weeks, the 2022 book, but I'm already working out the idea for the 2023 book. So it's tricky. Then when I'm actually writing the book and using the notebook, what I'll do is usually I might take a day during the week to do those, to just spend a couple of hours thinking about those four chapters in a grid. And I also do something else that I learned from this woman. And when I was in the magazine business, she wrote a book on intuition. And she said, sometimes when you're stuck creatively, you put the question out to the universe so maybe it would have been a question like, why does Summer begin to believe that Hannah might have played a role in the murder? And then all of a sudden your subconscious starts just spitting out answers to you. So I like to leave myself a day when I'm not writing to just be thinking of those four chapters 
And I just loosely outline those, then start writing. I love that. That's really interesting too, to kind of just, I feel like a lot of authors talk about what they're actively doing to write it, but not the like moment of you have to kind of let things sit and you have to let it come to you. So I, I really enjoy hearing that process. It, it, um, it, it's a magical process. I have to say, I never realized when I first wanted to write fiction that I, I knew it would be difficult that you've got to put your butt in the chair and you got to find ways to keep it there. I try everything from Lisa Gardner told me she has a scented candle on her desk. I do that. I give myself little rewards. And so I knew the challenges. I don't think I ever realized that you would have these moments, not every day, but these moments where your brain tells you something that you didn't see coming at all. And it's a twist or a turn or a revelation in the book. That's just so much fun for you to go. And sometimes it's kind of sad. I remember once thinking, oh, I didn't know he was going to die. That's sad, but he's going to die. <laughs> and the, these things just happen for you. It really lends, I think, an authenticity to the to the, the twists and the turns and the everything that happens within the plotting. So that's really interesting. Like I'm, I'm in all that. And, and just moving from one book to the other, I mean, you kind of, it, while you're in the midst of a book and moving to a next, that's really, really interesting. And this is your 15th book, correct? Right. So, right. Um, and you feel like, I mean, because it sounds like you have your process really like kind of locked in. Has that changed dramatically over the years? Or is this something that you kind of found and held on to as far as you, how you approach your stories? Well, the two things that changed for me, because I I think right from the beginning, I always had to start with plot. I don't know why that's just me. And then quickly kind of get character in there, though, probably with the Bailey books, I had a sense of her. But in the beginning, because I had some procrastination issues, I had heard about a strategy where you, you slice the salami and you cut it down into different portions, smaller portions. So it's not so daunting. So I started writing only 15 minutes a day because I was afraid if I said to myself, I'm going to write all day Saturday. When I had tried that, it hadn't worked. And when I committed to the idea of writing a mystery, I started really small. And now I can write for hours. You just build up over time. So I think that changed for me. And also in the beginning, I would aim for how much time am I going to be able to convince myself to sit here? But eventually I started aiming for page count because that then gave me something really clear and I didn't keep reworking the same sentences over and over again. Oh, and one other thing, uh, I heard the fabulous author CJ Box say this. He said he started every day with his editing of the day before. And now that I don't have a full-time job too, I've been doing a bit of that. It's really great because then it saves you from all of a sudden starting to edit after like five or six chapters and realizing, oh my gosh, I have so much rewriting to do. So I, I try to edit every day as well as write. Fascinating. Um, I do just want to call out that our friend and amazing author who we heard a voicemail from earlier, Wiley Cash, was watching. He says, hey, everyone, I know both of these authors, uh, you and Laura, and they're both wonderful people along with being great writers. So, uh, Oh, I had the great pleasure of meeting Wiley at a literary uh, event, and uh, he's just amazing. Great, yes, great author, great person. Thanks for watching, Wiley. Um, yeah, so I would love to just know as far as, you know, you, you, you've been in the mystery genre uh, through your 15 books. Do you have authors who inspire your own writing, whether it was, you know, from long ago before you started, you know, writing full time or currently that you're reading that you love? One of the authors I really love, and I don't know how popular these books are anymore because they're kind of slow police procedural, but a Ruth Rundell's Inspector Wexford series. I love them because she always delivered in terms of great misdirection, but fair clues. So at the end, you would find yourself going, oh my gosh, I, I should have seen that. And as much as I like P.D. James and loved reading her books, I felt she had too much coming out of nowhere at the end. And I love that Ruth Rundell just 
made you feel a little bit stupid, but so satisfied at the end. I also just love the authors I've become friends with. One of the great things, I'm sure you've heard this about the mystery world is that people are so generous and readers gobble up mysteries there there's room for plenty of people so i don't think anyone ever thinks like hey if i do a favor for this person there might not be an opportunity for me plus i think they're just good people but i've become friends with karen slaughter and lisa unger and and alifair burke and so many other authors and they're just so they're so dark and witty and fun and I, I I love having them in my life. I, I I usually give a dinner party every summer tied to Thriller Fest, a big group of mystery authors. And I remember one time as uh, you know, we'll just kind of eavesdropping on dropping on some of the conversation. There was a big discussion about Ted Bundy. I'm like, yeah, I love these people. Hey, they're just as fascinated with Ted Bundy as I am. What's not to like? <laughs> but it's like Lee Child and Karen and Joe Finder. And it was just like, hey, great group. <laughs> Sounds like people. my kind of dinner party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lainey will definitely have to think the next one. But I might send you a little quiz first to make sure you're really not making it up that you, you know you know plenty about Bundy in advance. <laughs> <laughs> the Bundy entry exam. That yes, sounds exactly. intimidating. He <laughs> would probably yeah. love that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, well, Kate, I, there's a lot of love coming in on the comments. Um, just of your books, of this talk. Uh, I just want to make sure we didn't miss anything as far as questions go. I, you kind of touched on this, but our great friend Jennifer Winberry with the Hunterton Library says, do you think tricky twists that are so popular in thrillers are unfair? I do. Can I tell her from the daughter of a librarian to another librarian, some of them these days are just ridiculous. It's, it's like the in Jaws, the shark, I think in Jaws 9, you know, coming out of the water to take down the helicopter, it's just too much. And I think we need to take a pause and get back to stuff that can really happen. And that's, that's important for me as a reader, I know. Excellent. Yeah. Um, let's see, Janine Reed Robinson says these, uh, you write some of my favorite procedurals. Uh, let's see, just yeah, a lot of love for both of these books. And I also am so happy, of course, you, as you mentioned, your mother was a librarian, Laura, her mother was a librarian. It is. Oh, I didn't uh, know that about Laura. Yes, yes. So it's not something we planned, I don't think. Our, our, our great Virginia Stanley, who couldn't be with us today, she might have planned it because she works on that level. But um, I think it's just a great way to celebrate National Library Week and today National Library Workers we, uh, Day. And we just thank you so much for being with us, for sharing your thoughts about this book and about your process. I've learned so much. I mean, I, I, I still think about how you talked about your process, and I'm going to take some of that away and just think about it. Oh, thank um, you, Chris. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's been absolutely. great for me to be here. I just, I love being in touch with readers and librarians, of course daughter of a librarian and what's so it's so great to be on with Laura because as I was talking about ver verisimilitude boy she writes characters when she gets into their work you know it, it feels just like they really did that and I, I love her writing so much yeah it's um two fantastic mystery authors um so yeah we so appreciate your time and for being with us uh, let's see, I want to make sure we have your on sale date correct. Uh, Librarians e Galley is available now, so you can run to walk and download and read. Your book goes on sale June 29th. June 29th, uh, right. So uh, again, we'll be here before you know it. That is The Fiance. So good, so satisfying, so tightly plotted. I'm excited for everyone to read it. And uh, again, we, we thank you all. Kate, thank you so much for being with us today. Great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Lainey. Be well. You too. All right. Um, and before you all go, we do just want to share some uh, more great uh, voicemails, notes from uh, authors who have 
submitted their thoughts on libraries for National Library Week. Then you will go ahead and share one of those sure. now. So it's just loading. So we have one from fan favorite, Susan Lewis. Seppi's Rejoice. <laughs> Think of the library as book church. That's what a reader once told me. This is Susan Elizabeth Phillips. On behalf of readers everywhere, a big thank you to our nation's librarians for tending book church. <laughs> I love that so much. Book church. book church. I feel like sometimes after these door to doors, you know, I feel very like rejuvenated. And I think we say that a lot when we we log off and talk to each other. We're just like, I'm ready to go take on the world. Yeah. These authors are are so enthusiastic and it's just so yeah. wonderful to talk. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And again, viewers, if you want to share your own thoughts, the values, your love for libraries, what they've done for you, do share that. We'll put the link up in the comments so you can share the love, all the love. And uh, again, we thank you for joining us today. Uh, do we have any announcements we want to share otherwise, Lainey, as far as anything, what we're having for dinner, what we're reading? <laughs> um well some of the food in kate's book uh, did make me want to go on vacation and eat really good food um but no i think just join us on wednesday and we'll you'll see it on our blog we'll update throughout the week but we have some more voicemails so that wasn't all so come listen to those um including let's see what can i give you as an incentive who's the who's a super ex let's see kimberly mccrate hmm we have a really exciting one from our lead read where you got, it's like a quiz. Were you paying attention? We had our lead read. Well, we have a voicemail from that new book. So it's really exciting. Join us on Wednesday. You'll get to hear our audio. Excellent. Well, again, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, Wiley Cash, thank you for watching as well. Um, thank you to Laura and Kate for another fantastic episode. And uh, yeah, we'll see you all again very soon. You know where to find us, librarylovefest.com. Uh, be well, everyone. Thanks again. Have a great day. Bye.